That is the script, of course, and superheroes, and this is Dear 18 Minutes to 10 on Tuesday morning. My two guests this morning have somewhat miraculously made it through the traffic this morning. You've arrived on time, Brian Jackson and uh, Rhiannon Thompson. Good morning to both of you. Morning. Right. You came in from Hall, Rhiannon. I did indeed. But you came the long way. I did indeed. <laughs> and it was an even longer way. It was horrendous. 45 minutes to get across here. Because normally people, it's a quarter of an hour. You, you were trying to do a shortcut and other people have thought the same thing. I was trying to be smart. I thought, I'll go, I'll go, I'll head away from the traffic and come back in a um, different direction. But mm-hmm. obviously everybody felt, thought the same thing. I think everybody's thought of every shortcut yeah. there is. And you, Brian, made it in from Wrexham in an hour and a half. An hour and a half, <laughs> yeah. Beautiful, beautiful road, the A483 at the moment. <laughs> Lovely, love, isn't it? I love that roundabout. <laughs> Just keep <laughs> focused, right? It's all going to be worth it when it's done. <laughs> Yeah, supposedly. Uh, getting here from Wrexham, a minor challenge for you because we spoke a year ago last you were here and you'd just climbed up a mountain called Chub Choi in Nepal. Have I said that right? Chub Choi, that's correct. Chub Choi, yep. oh, yep. close enough. And that had previously never been climbed. That is correct, yeah. Since we last spoke, you have been up another previously unclimbed mountain and you've took your office manager, Rhiannon, with you. <laughs> <laughs> I did, yeah. We um, went together. We had a whole group of six of us um, called Narfu Peak. Okay, so this is, uh, what, in the same mountain range, is it, Narfu Peak? It's in exactly the same area. Um, it's a different range, but it's in the same area. So the area is called the Lost Valleys of Narfu, and it's called Narfu Peak, but it's in the Chulu range, which is a slightly range slightly further to the west. Sounds very romantic, and it must have been a wonderful <laughs> adventure, but actually, from the information that Rhiannon's given me, it was a real tough challenge, this. Yeah, it was a lot tougher than it we supposed it would be. We obviously do a lot of research on Google Earth, looking at the area, etc. But on this section of Google Earth, there happened to be a big white smudge from obviously a cloud <laughs> when they were taking the photograph <laughs> from the satellite. And um, so a lot of the stuff, we couldn't see a lot of features. So the hanging glacier that we didn't realise was going to be there until ah. we got there, which we had to get up. And the weather also played a huge part on the day. So, uh, Brian, you've obviously done this sort of thing before. Rhiannon, is this the first time you've done anything quite this mad and insane? Um, probably to this extent, but I have done um, a couple of high mountains uh, in the past. I did Kilimanjaro in 2011, and I spent most of my time on the hills of the UK. But in terms of this altitude um, in Nepal, it was the first time, and obviously an unclimbed peak. Definitely first time for that. 5,930 metres mm-hmm. in feet. That's about 18,000 feet? Yeah, Almost 20,000. Almost 20,000. Okay, almost 20,000. So that's high. <laughs> it is high. What, what are the, I mean, what are the main issues that you're dealing with when you're at that sort of altitude? Um, it's the altitude itself. I mean, it really just strips you of energy and your body can go one, one way or the other. So it can react quite okay to the altitude and you can get, get over fine. But it can just kind of really knock you. So you get, you can get altitude sickness, um, which gives you like nausea, dizziness and things like that. So you're kind of contending against those as well as the, the cold at that height. It can be so cold. And again, that just strips you of your energy. Well, we've all heard of altitude sickness, but I suppose unless you've suffered it, you never really quite understand what it is. That's true, yeah. Um, it's a difficult one to explain, but with the, the kind of like the lower limits of oxygen in the air, your body is trying to fight to get as much as possible so it's it really is in terms of energy zapping it really is um horrendous ones and obviously uh the worse it gets and sometimes it can get to the point where you're getting other kind of ailments as well which can be lead to obviously fatalities so you've got to constantly keep an eye on it and make sure that everybody in the team is you know dealing with it okay i, I hear that there were i think more than one occasion where you thought that's it we're just gonna have to abandon this we can't do it we've bitten off more than we can chew yeah in terms of the actual expedition um we kind of it was a bit of a roller coaster really in terms of the emotions because we before we set out there, the, there was a snowstorm in Nepal that hit the region in October, and that was the one that unfortunately killed um, a lot of the trekkers on the Annapurna circuit. That was last Easter, wasn't it? Uh, no, this was the one in October. So, ah. so Easter was the one at Everest. Right. Um, yes, of course. But October yes. was the one um, where the snowstorm kind of hit. Right. So before we even got out there, we weren't sure whether snow conditions were going to make it kind of passable to get there. And actually, when we got to Nepal, we had to change our itinerary, um, whereas we were going to approach the peak from the east. We actually had to con- continue on the Annapurna circuit and approach from the west because there was a five foot of snow on the high pass. And obviously, we, we wouldn't be able to pass that way. So a lot of the times, it was kind of like, are we going to be able to do this? You know, are we not going to be able to? When we eventually got to the, the high pass into base camp, we were actually camping on three foot of snow 
which, you know, is not ideal. Um, the ground temperature on average was minus 25, and uh, when we actually set off for the uh, the summit, we were contending with really, really deep snow. You know, for me, I'm, I'm small, but it's up to my waist, and, you know, trying to plough through this kind of snow at that altitude is just so tiring. So, Brian, why do people do this? Why do people put themselves through this? I mean, I've got to ask, it sounds yeah. horrendous. Yeah, that did sound horrendous. I mean, Thanks, great a great view from, a great view from on top, no doubt, but good grief, what an effort to get there. I think, I think part of the whole thing is the challenge. People like challenges and like to challenge themselves. I mean, to go to a region where nobody's walked before, you know, to make that first step on virgin territory is... It just blows your mind. It's mm. absolutely phenomenal because there aren't many places in the world left no, like that. No, true, yeah. So that, that's why people go and do it. But, you know, if you go up Kilimanjaro, you go every space camp, the views are spectacular. You're pushing yourselves physically, mentally, and a lot of people are raising money for charity while they're doing it. Yeah, which, of course, you, you guys yeah. did. We'll come to that in a moment. And I suppose it just depends. If you've got this sort of adventurous mindset, then you're going to want to do this, aren't you? And you're going to want to, once you've done it, do the next hardest thing. Yeah, I think... You come back from one, you say, oh, that's it, you know, I'm not going to do it again. It's only uh, normally a couple of weeks later before you're, <laughs> yeah. you're planning the next one. A couple of weeks and a couple of pints. <laughs> yeah, exactly that, <laughs> at the pub normally. That's where most expeditions start, yeah. And you're planning the next one, because if you are adventurous, you always want to do the next thing, yeah. really, I suppose. Yeah, and yeah. it's just fantastic to go to new regions, new areas. And Rhiannon, I hear you nearly lost a toe. You had frostbite in your toe. I did, yeah, unfortunately. Due Ouch. to the Yes. <laughs> a very interesting but very painful experience. Um, it's funny because I've, you know, I've read books about mountaineering expeditions and adventures and, you know, frostbite's always kind of mentioned but you always kind of think, oh, no, never be me. <laughs> um, but it was just a mixture of bad luck and the, the conditions actually on summit day because it was a 16-hour walk on summit day and obviously the ground temps as i said were minus 25 to begin with but as soon as we got onto the the glacier and the the wind kind of kicked in we were looking at minus 40 oh, um, temperature so for 16 hours at that kind of temperature you know something's got to so I mean, obviously <laughs> you were massively wrapped up with umpteen layers so what did you just get unlucky with this particular toe i think yeah i think it was just on the one foot just the one big toe um so the boots that i wore although they were kind of they were mountaineering boots probably weren't as good as they could have been um but the fact that it was only my left foot that got the frostbite i think it was just do the body so circulation um right. and things like that but uh yeah you're not going to lose the toe no uh, the body has been very good to me also and has managed to recover really well so oh, yeah no not going to lose the toe uh, fantastic no, oh and a real inspiring story and i know you're going to use this experience to uh try and inspire the next generation to to do adventurous stuff because you're involved with the Spinny Adventurers Club in Chester. Indeed, yeah, I think it's really important to inspire the younger generation, you know, that there's a whole world out there that you can go and explore and you can learn from the natural environment as well. So I started the Spinny Adventurers Club um, as part of the Spinny Day Nursery Holiday Club, which mm. I, obviously, it's my family business. Um, and we've been running through years now and it started off quite small, just getting a group of children into the local woods that we use and just introduce them to, you know, what's out there and how you can actually use the natural environment to play and to explore and that you know life isn't all about sat in front of the computer uh, or the tv mm, and totally. uh, yeah i think it's really important because you know in terms of conservation issues as well it's the next generation that's going to have to really look after it so i think by them getting used to it and being inspired by it mm. they're more likely to, to take on and it's more urgent now than ever because of the advent of digital technology and youngsters just love their computers and their tvs and their iphones and their laptops but you you your life can pass you by sat behind a screen can't it if you're not careful definitely exactly i mean I remember speaking to one child who was talking about how they had a computer game that was about the woods and you go fighting in the woods or something that's so, like you can go play in the woods yeah. in real life yeah. and they were like oh really yeah yeah, like, yeah no, let's go do that that's what we used to do back in the 80s <laughs> it was all cool yeah, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And Brian, you've raised uh, more money for uh, Nightingale House, the hospice in Wrexham. That's right, yeah. You said before that um, people use often use adventures like this to get some sponsorship to, to support a cause that's close to their hearts, and you've done just that. Yeah, that's uh, local hospice, so that's why, and I have a relationship with them anyway through... Um, Several people I know have been there, but mm. also um, we actually run challenges for them as well, so things like London to Paris, Three Peaks, etc. So it's a pretty obvious one to raise money for so yeah. it's great taking the t-shirt up and obviously having that on the summit and we actually left the t-shirt up there oh did you on the Brilliant. summit with, with the rocks um putting putting on it so it'll be there for quite a while I it will because you are the first two people up there ever so yeah. uh, you know along with the other four in the group so yep. who knows when the when the next visitors will come calling could yeah, be a while couldn't I it i don't actually think it will ever be climbed again actually oh um, really yeah i think we'll be the only people ever there it's um it's not on the route to anywhere it's not a peak that you'd use to wow. acclimatize for any other one so i actually expect we'll be the only people ever to do it that is truly amazing yes thank you very much for coming in both of you thank lovely you. to chat to you brian jackson the director of expedition wise and his office manager rhiannon thompson I keep 